Uh, I think we'll move. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khaled and Dr. Maggie. Uh, we'll move to the, the third uh, talk in this uh, session. Um, the next uh, talk is what is the next uh, so, step in, in CF care? Uh, a look into the future. Uh, this talk will be by Professor Jane Davis. She is a professor of pediatrics, respirology, experimental medicine at the National Heart and Lung Institute, Imperial College of London. And uh, she's going to deliver this talk. Uh, good luck, and uh, we would like to welcome you, Professor Davis. Thank you very much, Professor Al Habi and um, Professor Al Nazir. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. And uh, it was a pleasure to hear uh, at least part of the, the talk before, which I think leads quite well um, into what I'm going to talk to you about. So um, I'm going to really look at where we've got to and the achievements that we've reached to get where we are today, um, but take a little look into the future and what some of the remaining challenges globally um, we have that we still need to address. I will talk about some drugs which are either recently developed or in development for a number of different companies. So here's my declaration of interest. Um, I thought I'd just talk about how much has evolved in cystic fibrosis, some of which I think will be very clear to the audience. So we've made really great leaps in understanding basic science, both from the pathophysiology and also the genetic standpoint. And that has translated into big differences in the way we undertake diagnostics. So looking at newborn screening programs, but also an awareness that cystic fibrosis perhaps isn't quite the black and white disease we may have been brought up to believe, rather that there may be a spectrum of CFTR related disease. And I think very pertinent to this conference today, recognition that uh, cystic fibrosis is not a disease as is commonly quoted of the Caucasian population. It's a global disease. It's being recognized in nearly all areas of the world. But in some of those areas, a uh, lack of recognition may lead to delayed diagnoses as we've just heard. I think there's been a massive uh, improvement in, in therapies, both those targeting symptoms and more recently treating the underlying cause in the defective CFTR. And along with all of this, the population demographics and the prognosis of someone with cystic fibrosis has changed very dramatically. So the overall population is growing and that is being weighted towards the older population. I was brought up as a medical student that cystic fibrosis was a disease of children and now in many regions of the world, mine included, there are more adults than there are children. Uh, we're going to probably see age-related changes in disease status. Uh, CF disease is for age becoming slightly uh, better controlled, but we're probably also going to observe new diseases related to aging and emerging complications of CF in later life. Um, we will need to be looking into the future on the basis of that into uh, optimizing our delivery of care, both the delivering of clinical services to expanding adult populations, but also how we deliver trials and research and monitor patients. And there's an increasing move towards exploring and trying to implement <clears throat> digital uh, monitoring procedures with a remote focus so people have to travel less to the centers. The other thing which I think sadly is evolving is probably the inequity that we're all aware about um, globally. In, in, on the basis of, of general socioeconomics, but also uh, disease management. And as the highly expensive drugs are becoming available to people in certain countries and not available to those in others, either for reasons of genetics or cost, um, that gap really is increasing. So this is where it probably all started in terms of the pivot point in 1989 when Lap Chi Choi and Francis Collins dis discovered the CFTR gene itself. And since then, we're very aware that uh, cystic fibrosis is a multi-organ disease. CFTR is expressed in many, many regions of the body, most of them uh, epithelial lined ducts. Um, but there's also increasing recognition that CFTR may be playing a role in circulating inflammatory cells in macrophages and also in neutrophils. Um, and I think we need to understand that more. This is just a snapshot of Europe. We saw some of the mutational diversity in your own region by the last speaker. Um, and I just wanted to highlight two things with this map. Firstly, the difference in prevalence in different countries. So over on the far left, Ireland, with a prevalence of one in 1400. Um, 
And over on the far right, for example, Finland, one in 25,000. So very variable in terms of frequency of CF birth. But also um, in all of the countries that are shown on this map, the commonest mutation being F508 del. And in most of those countries, it being very, very much commoner than the next mutations down. But those next mutations down do vary quite a lot according to region. And we're now aware that there are over 2,000 different mutations that have been described in the CFTR gene. Uh, they're probably not all disease causing, um, but of those, about a thousand of them have been reported in very, very few people worldwide, perhaps five people under. So we are really talking about a massive area that we need to learn more about if we're going to be able to enable patients with those mutations to reap the benefits of the advances that are being experienced by many others. So this is just to talk about this idea that CFTR related disease might be more of a spectrum than black and white. So on the y-axis we have percentage of normal CFTR function um, and then over to the far right uh, people presenting with classical cystic fibrosis with pancreatic insufficiency having very very low levels of normal CFTR function or not being able to detect that at all. Um, we know slightly further to the left that the group of people with pancreatic sufficient cystic fibrosis often have a mutation which confers some residual CFTR function, and that's enough to protect the pancreatic phenotype to some degree. Um, and if we move further to the left, we are becoming increasingly aware of CFTR-related diseases, which don't necessarily fulfill the diagnostic criteria of CF, but are associated with gene defects and usually single organ disease of the type that you can see there. Um, so this is, is becoming important and there are clinics emerging uh, around the world now to try and look at these more difficult diagnostic uh, patients who may not be quite so obviously classic cystic fibrosis. <clears throat> Since the gene discovery, the other thing that has uh, evolved very significantly, of course, is the newborn screening uh, that has become uh, established in many regions of the world. And the previous speaker talked a little bit about the advantages of this. <clears throat> and those advantages, I think, are very clear in terms of better nutrition, um, but also our ability to implement early physiotherapy and use antibiotics appropriately. One of the really major advantages that I've seen during my time in CF is the genetic counseling for families <clears throat> and the avoidance of another child with cystic fibrosis sometimes being born before the first child has been diagnosed. And I think that's had a really big impact on uh, psychological well-being. These slides were kindly provided to me by Professor Kevin Southern from Liverpool and really just shows how rapidly over the space of 20 years within Europe, newborn screening programs have become implemented. So over on the left in 2001, very few national programs, uh, some regional programs in a small number of countries. And now the situation is much more common that re national programs are in place. And many of those without national programs are developing regional programs or considering implementing them. So the coverage has expanded dramatically. I'm going to come on now to talk about how the understanding of the basic science has led to the development of CFTR modulators. Um, and to do this, let's just revise a little bit of the biology of what goes on with CFTR being expressed in the cell. So on the bottom of this screen is the nucleus of the cell, and then we can travel up through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi to the cell surface. Um, and that's the journey that normal mature CFTR protein will make. There are a number of things that can go wrong along the way if mutations are present in the gene. And the first of those is that no CFTR is made at all. And that's the sort of scenario with a, the stop mutations or the premature truncation codons. Globally, the commonest classes of mutations leads to protein that gets made in full length, but doesn't make it up to the cell surface because it's misfolded and it's recognized by the intracellular quality control processes as being faulty. f 508 del is obviously the classic example of that. And then the other types of mutations lead to protein that does get to the cell surface, but either it doesn't work properly when it's there or it's present in very low levels. And looking at this in this very simplistic fashion can lead us to think about how different drugs might be targeted at those groups. Um, and really they fall into three different groups in my opinion. The first is that for this group here where there's no CFTR, 
current modulator drugs have got no substrate to work on. Those mutations are unresponsive to drugs we're currently terming, <coughs> terming modulators. And patients who have two copies of these mutations will potentially in the future benefit from read-through drugs if they are successful, and may also be the group who are targeted for gene therapy, gene editing, mRNA type approaches. For the protein that uh, is misfolded and gets stuck in the cell, the modulators that are being um, de uh, developed for those are called correctors in that they correct the misfolding and allow that cell to traffic up to the cell surface. And for those proteins which are on the cell surface but need to work more, uh, potentiators are drugs that can enable that. And I think the really big breakthroughs have come by using the correctors and the potentiators in combination, whilst the mutations that lead to um, a CFTR which is suitable for a potentiator on its own are pretty rare. Um, f 508 del works very well in combination with correctors to take it up to the cell surface and then a potentiator to improve its function. So these are the two phase three trial publications which came out just over a year ago now, back to back, looking at two populations of people with triple therapy. So this is Alexacafta, Tezacafta and Ivacafta. The first two of those molecules are correctors and they work on different regions of the misfolded 508 del and ivacafta as of course you know is a potentiator and this was two different trials the first of which had patients who were heterozygous for 508 del and on their other allele they had a mutation that did not respond to these drugs this was testing the hypothesis that uh, harnessing efficacy from one f508 del was enough um, the other group was a shorter trial and patients with two 508 dels so here we have the primary outcome of both trials, which was change in FDB1. On the top is the heterozygous patients, and on the bottom, the shorter trial in the homozygotes. Um, and the top trial, this was compared against placebo, and you can see a very rapid improvement in FDB1, which was sustained over that six month period and reached 13 percentage points, so very dramatic. Uh, the bottom study was compared against tezacafta ivacafta dual combination because that's what patients were already receiving if they were eligible. Um, and the addition of the C third drug led to a, an improvement of over 10 percentage points in FEV1 on top of what was already being seen. So very dramatic in both cases. The longer trial was powered for pulmonary exacerbations and you can see a really dramatic impact on those here. And here are some secondary outcomes, um, mainly to show you the very abrupt and dramatic decrease in sweat chloride in both of those groups. The really quite dramatic improvement in quality of life score assessed by the CFQR. And in the longer of the two trials, um, accompanying improvements in um, nutritional parameters as well. Uh, the safety assays in, this, in these trials were that the drug was well tolerated in the vast majority. If we think about the longer term and what we might expect to get out of these drugs, of course, we don't know that yet with triple, but we can look back at our experience of Ivacafta in um, relevant populations and see what sort of improvements have we been aware of. So these are registry data from UK and USA looking at people receiving long term Ivacafta, so people with gating mutations. And there were a number of improvements in terms of long term impacts on pulmonary exacerbations. Pseudomonas infection rate. And here you can see a slowing in the loss of lung function over the several years after taking Ivacafta. We also um, heard that there was less incidence of CF related diabetes, which of course is hugely important in terms of prognosis. And in younger patients, we've seen good evidence of restored pancreatic exocrine function. Um, these Ivacafta benefits translated into improved survival and transplantation. And I think we would expect at least as good as this with Cafetrio, um, because I think most people think perhaps even it's got the edge over either Cafetrio as a single agent, but we should expect at least as good as this. It's really important that we try and capture the longer term benefits. And many of you will be aware that there is a study uh, taking place in the States at the moment um, called PROMISE, which is looking at lots of long term outcomes of people on triple agents. And in the UK and Ireland, we're part of a study called Recover, which is similarly looking to capture the real world clinical outcomes. 
Now, this is particularly important in UK because although our patients do have access to these drugs at the moment, um, funding has not always been easy for us to get through our nationalised healthcare system. And the NHS will be looking very carefully at all the evidence over the next few years that these drugs are worth using. So we think it's really vitally important that we try and uh, catch all of this data if we possibly can. So I'm very, very pleased that Professor Paul McNally in Dublin had the insight to launch this study and we're really pleased to collaborate with them on this. So really just a snapshot then of how much progress we've made over the last 50 to 60 years. If we go back to sort of the era when I was born and perhaps many of you, um, children were not regularly surviving to go to secondary school. Um, they were usually very malnourished and they weren't able to fight uh, lung infections. And we've seen a big increase in the evolution of symptom directed therapies over that time, um, which has been accompanied by very, very substantial improvements in survival. Now, clearly, not everybody looks like this CF patient over on the right of the screen here, but it is becoming commonplace in many countries that we're transitioning young people to adult care in really, really excellent health, both nutritionally and from a pulmonary aspect. And at the top right, you can see the uh, modulators that we haven't yet had an opportunity really to capture their impact um, fully. Uh, but I think we would expect that we're going to see even more of these very positive impacts. This is to show how much lung health is improving over all ages, particularly in older patients. Uh, you can see in different age groups here over the period from 1988 until now, uh, quite steep trajectories upwards, which are most notable in the lower regions. And this is just to show you the massive increase in uh, proportion of adult patients. Um, so the population's growing, but it's not growing because we're diagnosing more children or babies. It's because more of those children and babies are growing up to live into adulthood. And I think this has a lot of implications for future care. Um, adult services are going to need to uh, expand to provide for a larger clinical population, um, but the majority of those patients will be healthier than they have been previously. In parallel with that, there will be substantial numbers of those patients growing older with CF progression, plus also other diseases, so diseases of aging, such as cardiovascular, that we don't see commonly in adults at the moment, and also those related to CF, which become more common with age, and bowel cancer perhaps being a prime example of that. Um, we may also find that both children and adults, our conventional means by which we monitor clinical status will become less suitable. Um, we know that as people are healthier, the FEV1 remains normal for longer, but we very clearly know that does not mean there's no lung disease down there. FEV1 is not a sensitive measure of early stage lung disease, particularly in the peripheries. Um, somebody mentioned LCI earlier, which I'm very pleased about because it is a much more sensitive lung function test. We're using it primarily in paediatrics at the moment, but we will need it more and more in adulthood, is my belief, because I think people will go into adulthood with normal FEV1. We're also very interested, as are many other groups worldwide, in looking at imaging, particularly imaging techniques that might not have any radiation with them, as CT does, and MRI is advancing quite dramatically, and I think may provide us some useful tools in the future. We're a little concerned that as patients become healthier, we notice more and more of them don't produce sputum. And we know that uh, keeping a close eye on what the lower airway infection status is, is more difficult in that context. And there are a number of groups trying to look at ways to uh, develop non-invasive, non-sputum-based non means of getting a handle on that infection. And we're also aware that healthier people might be a uh, little reluctant to visit hospitals so frequently. They may want to engage in digital care and remote monitoring. And of course, one, if there is any good side to the COVID pandemic, one good side has been it has catalyzed those uh, services in a lot of countries because we had to provide uh, remote surveillance for our patients. And in the UK, at least, uh, most CF patients have home spirometry now, many of them Bluetoothing into systems that link directly to the clinic. Uh, we're also aware that healthier people might be reluctant to continue on their very burdensome treatment regime. Um, we know that CF patients really rate burden of treatment very high on their list of problems. Uh, this is something I use quite frequently just as an illustration 
of the huge impact that treatment and adherence to treatment has for patients with cystic fibrosis. And the James Lind Priority Setting Partnership, which was done in the UK by Alan Smith a couple of years ago, uh, really identifies that the first top priority for research of CF people is to look at the effective ways of simplifying the treatment burden for them. So I think this is massively important. Uh, there are two big studies of which I'm aware which are looking at this and um, simpl simplify run through the TDN in the US, which is a short four week period where patients who are stably established on triple modulators can randomize to remove their hypertonic saline or Dornase alpha. Um, and there are the endpoints. I think that study has already begun. And in the UK, um, we've just heard that the uh, National Institutes for Health Research will be funding this study called CF Storm, which is a similar sort of study, but is monitoring people for longer periods, having randomized them through our patient registry to withdraw mucolytic nebulizers or stay on standard care. I think this is really important. I think it's a danger that people will feel a lot better when they're taking triple modulators and then we'll just stop treatment. And we may not actually therefore get the full benefit out of the modulators because of course they were tested against standard of care at the time. A little bit about uh, remote monitoring. There are multiple programs going on uh, around the world looking at uh, research into programs of remote monitoring using a variety of different platforms. As I mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic was a really big, massive catalyst for change, but we do need more evidence to support these. Uh, the experience that was published from the US groups taking part in eICE, which was a remote monitoring for uh, exacerbation frequency, uh, found that those who were remotely monitored had more treatment for exacerbations but didn't have better pulmonary outcomes at the end of the study. So I think we need to look at acceptability and feasibility of protocols. We need to be really careful about data protection and the issues around that. And we need to look at health outcomes, but not only physical, but also mental. One of the concerns is that if people are constantly monitoring their health at home, it could lead to some anxiety or psychological lack of well-being. Um, and I think cost effectiveness is going to be really important based on the time involved for people at the centres looking at these data that are fed in digitally. I think it's unlikely that this will be substantially cheaper. Um, so we need to find ways if this is acceptable to patients of actually uh, getting buy-in from our healthcare providers. A little bit about uh, global inequality. This is not a map of cystic fibrosis. It's just a, a world hun hunger map to illustrate the huge disparities globally in so many aspects of our daily lives um, in terms of socioeconomics, access to healthcare, et cetera. Um, and this is evident, of course, when we look at CF provision of healthcare, um, there being uh, national uh, reference centers, there being easy access to people to travel for healthcare. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I do think that the arrival of uh, highly effective modulator therapy, particularly with its high costs, is widening this inequity. Um, and also uh, the fact that there are many populations around the world who have mutations which are not F508L um, and that we really need to try very hard to, to understand and support those populations uh, in the ways that have been described. Um, I was pleased to be a part of this uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine Commission on the Future of Cystic Fibrosis Care last year, which was led by uh, Scott Bell and Felix Ratchin, amongst others, and which brought in uh, many members from uh, less well-resourced countries to actually talk about uh, the future and what these challenges might be. So if any of you are interested in reading that, that's the reference. So I think, you know, the future is really bright for cystic fibrosis. Um, Patients at the moment are healthier than they've ever been before. And with the arrival of some of these new treatments and new, uh, managed, new, new measures of care, I think we can expect that we're going to continue to see improvements really quite dramatically. Um, but I think it's very important to emphasize that we're not there yet, um, that there are uh, proportions of the population for whom these uh, modulated treatments won't be suitable and that we need to work on the sort of platforms that we're being talked about in terms of theranostics and organoids uh, to make sure that those patients have every chance to benefit from drugs as they are developed. 
um, and to also support the trials which might develop gene therapies and other uh, mutation agnostic therapies, as well as trials that will continue to uh, optimize symptom directed therapies. I think a lot of the um, huge progress we've made over the last few decades has been working in partnership um, across the Atlantic um, with clinical trials networks, the CF Foundation and national um, foundations in different countries, but also registries and patient organizations. And I, I've got CF Europe and the CF Trust on here because they're particularly closely involved in some of the work I do. And I think it's that networked type of approach which is going to continue to leverage increased benefits as we move forward. So thank you so much for your attention. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and I'm happy to answer any questions or to be contacted via the routes at the bottom of the slide here afterwards. Thank you so much, Professor Davis, for this nice uh, presentation with uh, a lot of hope. And uh, I think we need such uh, uh, messages, we need such uh, a hope, a light for us, especially in our area where we do have our cystic fibrosis in our region still really lagging behind the international standards. And hopefully with such a, a meeting, such conference, we can close these gaps and we can make very good, um, you know, uh, networking with the European as well as the North American cystic fibrosis expert people. We need to move our area, we need to improve our situations, and that's why uh, these efforts have been made for the last few uh, few years. I have a question for you. Uh, what do you do now in the era of COVID-19 with those uh, patients? Uh, in our region, we almost, uh, we have a struggle with, with catching them and uh, following them either before, because of the restrictions in the hospital due to the COVID-19 uh, limitations or because of the families themselves, they are afraid to go to the hospital. So what are the, the tips that, the practical tips that you can advise? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And, and earlier in the year, we were very, very anxious about uh, the fact that we thought cystic fibrosis patients would be particularly vulnerable to getting COVID infection. So they were put on a, a sort of protected shielding program staying at home. And that was what led to the really rapid rollout of the implementation of virtual services for them. So a provision of home spirometers, home weighing scales in some cases, and um, setting up of virtual clinics. So we do um, largely video based clinics now. Um, but as things have got a little better over the course of the year, we may see about a third of our patients face to face based on um, you know, really feeling that we need to for certain patients. Um, I think one of the things that's been very valuable is the work done by the European Patient Registry, which has gathered all reports of patients with coronavirus infection and has demonstrated to us actually that counter to our fears, uh, patients don't seem to be quite at the very high risk as we thought they might be, particularly younger patients and those with better preserved health. And that information has gone back to our families and are allowing them to feel a bit more comfortable coming out and attending clinic visits when we think it's necessary. So I think it's a hybrid of allowing them to be as well as possible assessed and monitored at home, but also making them feel as safe as possible when we do need to bring them up to the hospital. Thank you so much. Thanks Jane for an excellent talk and um, giving us hope and looking to the future. Reversing the irreversible, and I know you probably mentioned a few bits here. Are we uh, ready for seeing some reversibility of the bronchiectasis and the liver disease? And now we've, we've seen some markers that nutrition <coughs> has improved when children arrive back after to the extent that they might have to stop or reduce the uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Is this something I know you're, the, the, the promise and our own recovery in UK and Ireland will answer these questions. But if you were to look into the future, would you expect this? So it's an interesting question, Basil. I mean, I was brought up to believe, and I still hear frequently, bronchiectasis is irreversible. Some of the data from early childhood coming out of the ARREST CF program in Australia might make you think that that isn't as clear cut as we thought. Um, and I was also brought up to believe that postnatally uh, pancreatic exocrine damage was irreversible. And now we know it's not, but we only know it's not because we've had the drugs that have demonstrated it's not. So I think it's hugely important that we try and 
make sure we don't go in with these expectations that what we believe is right. It is possible that, that bronchiectasis is not as fixed as we believed, but we've just never been able to turn the clock back before. I think it's equally possible, if not more, that actually many aspects of advanced lung disease won't be reversed and that for patients who've got really pretty end stage disease, we might be good at clearing mucus now, but we may not turn the clock back on that damage. I don't think we know until we capture it. That's why I think using CT, for example, using LCI, some of those more sensitive techniques, we really need to try and understand what these drugs are capable of. And future drugs, it may be that we can achieve even more with some other drugs. True. And there's a question here, and I know it's a, it's a seminar on its own, but what's the stumbling block in gene therapy in cystic fibrosis? <clears throat> that is a seminar on its own, actually. It's probably a week of seminars on its own, isn't it? Um, okay, so if, if I could summarize, I've been involved with the UK Gene Therapy Consortium for over 20 years now. I think that the perhaps one of the notions is that you are taking an organ of the body which has evolutionarily designed to keep things out and you're trying to get it to take up foreign material and on top of that you're putting the foreign material into an airway which has already got um, new obstacles in terms of mucus obstruction airway wall thickening etc so access to the correct type of cells is a really big stumbling block at the moment um, and the other stumbling blocks relate to the fact that many of the vectors that have been quite successful at getting the genes into the cells, they lead to um, an immune response within the host. And so they therefore uh, can't be given repeatedly. And with CF being a lifelong disease, that's an absolutely essential prerequisite. Um, the Gene Therapy Consortium at the moment has a vector that they think is very long lasting and can be given repeatedly and is getting closer to clinical trials, but we're not there yet. Um, and I think that gene editing, for all it sounds absolutely amazing, it's gonna have the same problems in terms of getting that stuff into the cells. It's very different in the airway than it would be in the liver, for example, which is designed to take things up. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jane, for this nice presentation and uh, looking forward to have you next year in Riyadh face-to-face. -face. 